Well, David, you didn't mention that this is not that this is not a generic conference, nor is it very similar to the conference that was given this morning. And you can't substitute the information between them, and they're certainly not interchangeable. But aside from that, I want to give you a little bit more, you know. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks to my wife. Um, Brian gave you some of the details regarding the concepts of uh, immunogenicity and aspects, but I want to take a step back, actually, and talk about why we're having this conversation about biosimilars really in the first place. Um, as most of you are aware, there has been a change in the uh, way that, in the cost of inflammatory bowel disease. Indeed, a number of years ago, with the introduction of the biologics, um, we saw this big jump in the cost of care for patients. Prior to 2000, the biggest costs of care were hospitalizations and surgery. And what's evolved since our new medications and, um, uh, and such is that the cost of care has now shifted and is now primarily medical costs rather than hospitalizations and surgery. And this has become a significant burden um, to uh, all of the different societies. And that biggest cost of care is actually attributed to the biologics, not just an in inflammatory bowel disease, but as you can imagine in all of the immune-mediated diseases, you're seeing this now increasing in, in um, cancer therapies, which are primarily biologic now, as they're, they're targeting different um, uh, components. So this is uh, now creating the biggest cost of care, which is uh, the medical care. And it's now been estimated that the global expenditure in 2012, four years ago, um, was $169 billion, nearly 20% of all medication costs uh, together. So we can uh, understand that, and this is not diminishing, of the new drugs that we're talking about. We just saw ustekinumab approved, which is another biologic, two years ago, vedaluzumab. Um, it won't be until next year that within the past five years that we've seen a non-biologic actually approved for inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the development of laws and regulatory uh, provisions, both in the United States and in Europe and around the world, are attempting to reduce those costs by allowing pathways for biosimilars. You've heard repeatedly, not only from Brian, but at other points in the conference, that these are not generics, that you cannot create an exact replica of infliximab or adalumumab or vedaluzumab or any of the biologics. These are not identical. They're not chemicals, they're proteins. And the important aspect of the protein is that we are able to replicate that backbone of proteins, but as Brian so eloquently described, it is the sugar compounds, the sugar moieties, that actually give this protein its final tertiary and quaternary shapes that actually define the function. It's not the backbone itself, it's the entire structure that does that. And so by changing these sugar moieties, you're going to change the structure in one way or another, one could change it to affect function, and Brian talked about the potential changes in impact on immunogenicity. So why are biosimilars on the rise? Well, this, the title of this is actually a patent cliff. We're getting to the point now where the current proprietary biologics of infliximab and adalumumab have passed their initial patents. Now, that doesn't mean that that fight is over. Um, both Janssen and um, AbbVie have multiple other patents that are still in process. And while the FDA has approved the biosimilars for infliximab from Hospira and has approved the, and eventually Hospira purchased by Pfizer, and while they have approved the biosimilar for adalumumab, which is Abby's product, 
the biosimilar produced by Amgen, there are still patents that prohibit the marketing and use of these drugs. So that when a company decides to use an approved product while it is still under patent, there are US patent laws that may restrict it and may put this up to um, potential liability if indeed the patents are actually upheld. But the original patents have come to an end in a way that many companies will protect their, their property is by extending and making additional patents. And those processes are still underway, even though Inflectra, which is the biosimilar to infliximab, uh, will be starting to be marketed as of Monday. It will be available um, to pharmacies as of Monday. So in order to handle this patent cliff and the end of patents, the authorities around the world have developed regulations regarding the development of biosimilars that are somewhat different, significantly different, I should say, than the development of new chemical entities. And uh, we dis will discuss that a little bit. What you can see on this slide is where the ends of the patents for a variety of different products, including infliximab and adalumumab are, and as you can see, they are essentially ending within the next several years. Around the world, regulatory authorities have begun to develop uh, pathways for biosimilar development and approval. And please note, while there is some degree of harmony, the regulations in Europe and in the United States and in Canada and in other countries do have some differences that may be uh, important for, for the individual uh, states. Based on the concept of biosimilars, it has been predicted that there will be a significant cost savings with the introductions just as we've seen now in comparison to what happens when generics come on the market. Even though these are not generics, in many ways they are obviously similar and can replace, according to the different regulations, the proprietary uh, drugs. And that intent is the U.S. government and the Affordable Air, uh, Affordable Air, the Affordable Care Act has put a provision specifically for biosimilars with the concept of saving about $25 billion a year or $250 billion over the next years. The concept is to allow the release of these funds to, number one, increase patient access and for reinvestment to underserved needs for other drugs and perhaps for future innovations. This is the concept. It remains to be proven, and many of us ask who's actually going to be saving money. We doubt it's going to be our patients. It's likely to be third-party payers at the present time, but uh, whether this concept will actually come to fruition uh, remains to be established, and that's the hope. So the real question is, if with, with this or without it, how are we going to afford the care for all of these patients with immune-mediated diseases to be on essentially long-term, even life-term uh, biologic therapies until novel innovations allow replacement by perhaps less costly agents. So the FDA has defined biosimilar as a product that is a biologic, and the difference between biologic and chemicals is that biologics are produced in living cells, whether it's a bacteria, a fungus, whether it's a cell culture, that's where biosimilars are made. You can insert the genes to create that backbone protein structure, but depending upon the environment that that cell is living in, the post-translational carboxylation, in other words, all those sugar molecules that are going to surround it are different. And that's going to be based on a ver wide variety of factors, including the temperature, the pH, the consistency of the bath that the cells are in, um, how long they are bathed, multiple, multiple factors uh, come into that.
And that's why biosimilars are different from generic drugs. The biggest cost of developing drugs is not just the creation of the drug in a test tube or in a vat. It's in the clinical trials. And so the abbreviated pathway is kind of reversing the pyramid of how drugs are actually developed. In the biosimilar pathway, the onus is on the analytics, not on the clinical trials. And this concept of extrapolation, that if a drug that is approved for both Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis works in rheumatoid arthritis, that it should be extrapolated that it will also work in Crohn's disease. That's a similar agent. Of course, we do know of drugs that work in RA that don't work in Crohn's disease, but again, I'm not uh, implying that they are similar. So the pathway reduces the need for clinical trials in every single uh, indication that the innovator has. Now, sometimes this process has gone wrong. And one example of that is that in a um, production of epopoietin, which again is a protein, it's been on the market for a long time, and there was development of a similar EPO uh, product, but it had a small difference in an excipient, in polysorbate, that was unrecognized to have any clinical effect until that new product was put into people, and there were examples of aplastic anemia that occurred not due to the EPO component, but to the excipient. We okay on time? We're doing all right. So what actually goes on, even with the innovators, and we didn't always recognize this, is that the drugs that we're seeing today are not 100% identical to when they were approved. In Fliximab 2016 is not an exact replica of infliximab 1998, nor for adalumumab or any of the different biologic processes. Because as these commercialization increases, the need to, to develop more product expands, new plants open, there may be subtle differences in the manufacturing process, but each of those differences is then submitted to the regulatory agencies, and the regulatory agencies assess whether those subtle differences have any significant impact on the originator. And they've concluded to the products that we're seeing today that there has not been a significant impact. But even within a vial of infliximab or a syringe of adalumumab, batch by batch, you're gonna see a variety of different products. These are proteins, as you can imagine. Some little bits and pieces may get split off along the way. If you shake it too hard, you may break down the structure. If you freeze it and then thaw it and refreeze it, you may change that protein structure. So in any batch or in any different series of batches, there are going to be subtle differences, but the agencies have developed in conjunction with the pharma companies guidelines and limitations of how much variation is actually going to be acceptable. And there may be different variations on different sugars, on different endpoints that get cleared off. So this analysis is quite comprehensive. And frankly, it behooves us, we have to trust the industry and the agencies that these differences are going to be so subtle that they're not going to have any clinically relevant effect. And this is Brian's concern that there's a lot of places where this could potentially go wrong. So our agencies, the FDA, has determined that it is going to be the totality of evidence. It's not going to be any one component, but all have to come together in the whole, and any break in this chain could be sufficient in order to not approve a biosimilar product. But as I mentioned, the foundation is going to be on analytics. Is it chemically the same? Is the structure the same? Are the assays of function the same in vitro? And then getting on to clinical development. And it is only required 
for a new biosimilar to show in one or two populations, depending on how representative those populations are, that the drug can then be accepted for extrapolation to all of the indications. So infliximab, as you know, or adalumumab, have multiple indications, not only Crohn's disease, but ulcerative colitis in adults, um, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and um, there are multiple indications. A study in one will allow extrapolation to the others. So we're not new to this, and actually Brian in Canada is not new to this. Um, the infliximab biosimilar has been approved not for IBD, interestingly, in Canada until recently, but for the other indications in Canada. And in Europe, um, there have been uh, uh, Inflectra, or the biosimilar to infliximab, has been approved for now for several years. And what you can see is that there is a gradual increase, just as you would see with the introduction of a generic. And of interest with generics, the cost savings usually do not occur with the first generic. It's usually after the second or third generic that we begin to see increasing competition and uh, cost savings. Now David showed a pool of a number of, of uh, uh, gastros and dermatologists and rheumatologists who were queried about biosimilars. And they were queried at one point in time. We have the opportunity to look at what happened in Europe and the opinions before and after the introduction of the biosimilars. And what you can see is, before it was approved, and ECHO actually put out a guidance saying, we don't want biosimilars, essentially. Um, but after it was approved in Europe and they became experienced, what you see is that there is a uh, gradual, at least over two years, um, uh, a custom and acceptance of these products pretty much because they're a fait accompli, and we'd all agree they are a fait accompli uh, in the United States. Nevertheless, can I go back one slide? Um, we have a number of concerns, and I'm afraid that one of the concerns that I didn't list here is that as a GI community, as a physician community, we're starting to feel emasculated we're starting to feel that the control is being taken away from us. And this is just another example. And I think that that's kind of an overriding concept uh, to our angst over this. Nevertheless, there are some important aspects for GI because you are less likely to, you know, when we ask you, I'll ask in the audience, how many of you would like to see a trial in IBD? How many of you do not want a trial in IBD. It's no one. The real question is, do you need it? Brian says you need it. The government says you don't need it. Brian's already talked about immunogenicity, and we may not learn about this. Remember, we didn't learn about the immunogenicity of infliximab in reality until it was approved for one dose in Crohn's disease and three doses for fistulizing Crohn's disease. It wasn't until we gave a dose when they flared later that we started to see this rapid rampage of uh, serum sickness and the real immunogenicity. Brian's concern is that we haven't put these drugs through that stress test yet. Thus, it behooves us and it's gonna behoove our pharmacists to be able to monitor this and look what's happening uh, to see in the future for subtle differences for subtle side effects, for potential loss of response or other evidence of immunogenicity. And indeed, that's why these drugs are not going to be labeled as just generic infliximab, but they will have a four-letter determination at the end. So the pharmacist, it's not going to be us who know that DYYB infliximab is being given, but so that we can trace it back if that's going to happen. And you can see Brian's face and skepticism uh, regarding that. Finally, the FDA has approved these drugs for marketing, at least for infliximab and adalumumab similars, but they have not approved the concept of interchangeability. 
the interchangeability, these multiple switches or non-medical switches that Brian alluded to is a little bit different. And we asked the question in the panel yesterday at the main session, if you have a patient on long-standing infliximab, do you care if they are switched to a biosimilar? And the majority of the audience, you know, cared. They didn't want to because there was only one thing that can happen. When you have a patient who's doing well, there's only one direction that they can go in. On the other hand, when the audience was polled, if you have a new bio-naive patient, would you care if they received the biosimilar to the um, proprietary drug? And then there was, in that situation, there has been generally less reluctance in that setting. Nevertheless, I respect very much Brian's views and David's views and all of our views and skepticism regarding it. Nevertheless, the biosimilars are here. We are relying on our regulatory agencies and industry to make thorough evaluation. And um, hopefully, that cost savings will not just be to industry, but also will be for our patients as well. Thank you.